The scripture reading for this morning's sermon is taken from the book of Joshua, chapter 1, verses 5 through 9. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I'll, I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and of good courage. For to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left that you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth but you shall meditate it in it day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. You may be seated. Once again, I'm privileged to say good morning, church. It's a privilege always for us to be here. Uh, we notice uh, once again uh, quite a bit of the church being missing. And uh, we know where uh, quite a few of our families are today. Uh, we are blessed with a number of, of uh, children uh, today. And uh, we may need to have uh, an adult, an additional adult to help uh, with the, the caring of these children because it may be uh, too much uh, for our staff this morning. So please uh, keep your eye open if you can be of service in that regard. Please don't hesitate to help, because it could very well be needed. Well, you notice that we're looking at the book of Joshua. Ah, oh, that happens to be the book that Brother Ramazetti is teaching on Sunday morning. In fact, not too long ago, we read and studied these very verses. And they are wonderful verses. Uh, there, are, there are so many things that are involved just in verses 6 through 8 that uh, would take so much of our time to consider. In fact, I'm going to tell you right now, a lot of the scriptures that will come up on the screen, I will only be able to give you highlights of them. Uh, you have the outline, and when we get through today, I hope you take it home, read it, and study it uh, for yourselves. Uh, but notice that these are among the opening words of the Old Testament book of Joshua, uh, and the man that is about to step forward to lead the people finally into the land of Canaan is the trusted minister of Moses, Elijah. Uh, 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 Joshua. And so God had early instructed Moses to select Joshua to succeed him as leader of his chosen people in the land of Canaan. We're going to be looking from time to time to Numbers chapter 27 and see how all this puts together. There is a pattern that is to be followed here about God being with uh, his people, being with his leaders, when those leaders are done, God is still with those leaders, the new leaders, as he continues to be with his people. We are reminded that near the end of Moses' life, God had also exhorted Israel to be strong and to be of good courage. So what we're, what we're going to be looking at this morning is the very things that are said to these leaders are not limited to the leaders. It's for the benefit of, of us all. And so we read in Deuteronomy 31, verses 1 through 6, that Moses went and spoke these words to Israel. He's speaking to the people. And you look down in verse 6. He says, be strong and be of good courage. You see, it's not just for uh, these leaders. It's for the benefit of everybody. 
You know, it's very easy for us to look at these passages and say, well, you know, that was good for them and, and for those people. But I don't know how much application that has for me today. Well, it has every application. Uh, that's why it has been preserved for us unto this day. And then immediately in the same chapter, the next verse, Moses called for Joshua and he charged him to be strong and to be of good courage. And it says, then Moses called Joshua and said to him, in the sight of all Israel, this was important. Everybody needed to hear this. Be strong and of good courage, for you must go with this people to the land which the Lord has sworn to their fathers to give them. And you shall cause them to inherit it. And the Lord, he is the one who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Do not fear nor be dismayed. Isn't that something? Now the same words are being said before all the people to their new leader, Joshua. And by the way, he certainly was not a stranger to them. He was only one of two men that had left Egypt over the age of 20 that would be allowed to enter into the promised land. All the rest of the people except Caleb perished in the wilderness. Even Moses will not be allowed to enter in. That's why Joshua is being called at this time. And so three times God says, be strong and be of good courage. Look at our scripture reading once again. Be strong, verse 6, and of good courage. Verse 7, only be strong and very courageous. And then again in verse 9, be strong and of good courage. Do you suppose that this was an important message to get across? You know, uh, it's not often that God would repeat something like this or any command in the same context. This was extremely important. And brethren, it is just as important to us now as it was with them then. The question we need to ask this morning, and it applies to us too, is how could Joshua be strong and be of good courage? You know, this, you know God just said, do it, do it, do it. Well, does he get any help? Does he get any instruction? Does he get any encouragement? May I put before you this morning that the very context tells both him and us how this is to be done. How can we be, of, be strong and of, be of good courage? Well, first of all, Let's remember our relationship with God in the past. And I hope it's a good one. Because if it's not, you're going to have some difficulty now. But these people had a relationship with God. Moses and Joshua had a relationship with God. God had proven himself. He had been faithful to Moses Look back at verse, at our scripture reading again, verse 5. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life as I was with Moses. So I will be with you. Take him right back to their history. God had been faithful to them. Moses was God's faithful servant. We read in verses 1 and 2 of Joshua 1. And Joshua had been Moses' faithful assistant. 
Look at what we read here. Opening verses of this book. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun. Moses' assistant saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to them, the children of Israel. Do we not already see that there's only one thing that God has ever asked of his servants? There has only been one thing that God has ever asked of his people. And that is to be faithful. We're reminded in, in Revelation 2 in verse 10. Those people going through persecution. Jesus says to John the Apostle. Be thou faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of righteousness. The crown of life. That is the only thing God has ever asked of us. And it should cause us to say, am I being faithful to God? How is faithfulness defined? And how well am I doing? You see, no one can be faithful to God without doing God's word. Go back to our reading once again, Joshua 1. Look at verses 7 and 8. I told you you're going to find the secret within the immediate context. He says, only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate, it, meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and you will have good success. How can I be strong? How can I be courageous? God's word helps me with that, doesn't it? In fact, I wouldn't know to be strong and courageous had it not been that God's word told me that God said that. I need that bit of information, don't we? The previous generation received the law at Sinai. You read that in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 1 through 21. In fact, you have all the Ten Commandments listed there. It's the second recording of the Ten Commandments. We're more familiar with Exodus 20. It's repeated the last weeks of Moses' life in Deuteronomy chapter 5. But these people who had received that law at Sinai died in the wilderness because they did not keep it and were unfaithful. Now I want you to notice what Moses has to say to their credit. Look at the very next verse, verse 28. Then the Lord heard the voice of your words when you spoke to me and the Lord said to me, I have heard the words of this people which they have spoken to you they are right in all that they have spoken they pledged their faithfulness to God when they initially received the law a short time after they had left the land of Egypt and had been delivered out of Egyptian bondage on that occasion they swore to God that they would keep his law. And Moses says that was a good thing to do. It was one of the right things they did. But they did not follow through. Look at the next two verses. Oh, 
that they had such a heart in them that they would fear me and always keep all my commandments that it might be well with them and with their children forever. Go and say to them, return to your tents. God knew what they were going to do. Even though they swore that they would keep his law and be faithful to him. Do you suppose people do that today? Huh? Do you think people in the church do that today? Do you suppose we might have people in this church, in this congregation, that have done that? Or are doing that? That's why it's important for us to read these things. Yes, it's history. But it's history that has application to us today. That's why we're that's why we're having this lesson today. What was the consequence? Even though they could trust God, God could not, could not trust them. He could not depend upon them. And so what does God do? He seeks his fellowship with his leader, Moses. Look at the next verse. I, you know, you may look at this and not realize how sad this is. He tells the people, you know, you didn't keep my word. You, you, go, you just go back to your tents. You're, you're, you're just not into this. And the next verse says, but as for you, he's talking to Moses. He says, as for you, stand here by me, and I will speak to you all the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments, which you shall teach them, that they may observe them in the land which I am giving them to possess. Therefore you shall be careful to do as the Lord your God has commanded you. You shall not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. Now, I find this reading very interesting, especially at the end of verse 31, which you shall teach them that they may observe them in the land which I am giving them to possess. Moses was to do that, but he will never live to see them possess the land. Because they will not Learn this principle for, a, for 40 years. And only then will they be allowed to enter into the land. Not under the leadership of Moses, but under Joshua. And so first of all, they were able to be strong and to be of good courage because they had a reliable past with God, even though they were not faithful to God. God was faithful to them. Secondly, they had gained a knowledge of God's word. You see, no one can be faithful to God's word if he doesn't know God's word. Do we have to take time to explain that? I can't do God's word, what God says, if I don't know what God says. I've got to know his word. God's people will know it if what? They meditate on it day and night. That's what we find here in verse 8. They were to observe it by doing all that is written in it. Not just what pleased please them. It's not going through a dinner line, smorgasbord or so on, just selecting the parts you like. You are supposed to do it all. And they were not to turn to the left or to the right. Stay right on what God has told you. In the next place, 
they were able to be strong, this was a possibility, and to be of good courage because they had a very distinct calling. Among all the peoples of the earth, he had called these people. He had called Joshua, just as he had called Moses. These are the people of God. They had a distinct calling that separated them from everybody else. And when it came to the appointment of Joshua, God directly told Moses to select Joshua as his successor. Notice what we read in Numbers 27. I promised that we'd come back to Numbers 27. Well, here we are, and still we can't read all this. <laughs> but if you've been in the class on Sunday morning, you know we've recently studied this. So I'm trying to go back over, because for many of you, well, some of you anyway, this is still fresh in your memory. So what better way to, to reinforce that? Well, it's still fresh. And so here's what we read. And the Lord said to Moses, Take Joshua the son of Nun with you, a man in whom is the Spirit, and lay your hand on him, set him before Eleazar the priest, and before all the congregation, and inaugurate him in their sight. And it continues in verse 23. And he laid his hands on him and inaugurated him, just as the Lord commanded by the hand of Moses. Wonderful. He was selected before all the people. So the people would know. And then God himself commissioned Joshua to lead his people. So it started out with Moses Making that, the, uh, making that announcement. And now God talks to Joshua to reinforce that. Is what we read in Joshua 1, verses 1 and 2. So, well, uh, that's good, fine and good for them. But, but they had a distinct calling. Listen, we have a distinct calling. God has called us from all the people of the world. He's called us to be his disciples. He's called us to be his, the followers of his son. He has called us to be Christians. No, not from another man, but by the gospel itself. Paul so stated in 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 15, For though you might have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you do not have many fathers, for in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. That's how we entered into the family of God. Through the gospel. Finally this morning, we are to understand that if Joshua was going to be strong, if he was going to be of good courage, he had to have some sense of divine presence. He had to have the assurance that God was with him and working with him because without the presence of God, he wasn't going to be able to get this job done. Even if he kept the law exactly. You know, when I go back and I look at the wilderness wanderings and with all that Moses put up with, how, did, how was he able to endure that? And not only that, that when the people rebelled against God and God was determined to destroy them, Moses pleads for the people. He could have just as well as said, God, you're right. You're out of here and I'm out of here. But he didn't do that. He pled for the people. And he convinced God. And he said, well, I don't know how he could do that. It just shows you the kind of man he, he was. 
God was still going to lead his people into the promised land, but it wouldn't be that generation. <laughs> right? God was still able to accomplish that. Do you notice that God keeps on repeating that promise to Joshua? I will be with you. I will not leave you. I will not forsake you. And then there's a beautiful thing that happens. At the end of chapter 1 of Joshua, and I want, you, I want you to listen how the hearts of the people have changed. Let's look at verse 17. Here's what they say to Joshua. They say, just as we heeded Moses in all things, so we will heed you. Only the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. You know, first of all, we, we could read that and say, as we heeded Moses in all things. He said, well, that's not true. Wait. They're talking about their generation. The generation that has prepared themselves to enter the promised land. Not talking about the previous generation. It's not the we who died in the wilderness. They wouldn't be speaking here. <laughs> It's the new generation that God has disciplined and made his own people so that they finally could enter into their promised land. You see, God could not do this on his own. The people knew that. And they say to Joshua, only the Lord your God will be with you as he was with Moses. Do you think the previous generation ever said that to Moses? That's why I said, how did Moses put up with all this? They must have been a tremendous encouragement to Joshua on this occasion. I want you to notice also from our reading just a moment ago, that God's spirit was already in J Joshua before Moses laid his hands on him. You know, we have a strange uh, teaching today in, in the church that I have never understood, that uh, the Holy Spirit is given by hands of people. Jesus is the administrator of the Spirit. And the Holy Spirit himself gives miraculous gifts in the first century as he saw fit. But Moses laid his hands on Joshua after it was affirmed that the Spirit was in him. And I don't know why we don't uh, consider that. We're not going to go back and read Numbers 27 again. We looked at it before. Brethren, it's important for us to look at these instances. instances. The things that are happening here in Joshua chapter 1. And understand that this was done to prepare us for God's presence in our lives. Here's, a, here's an interesting passage for you to consider. It's found in the book of Hebrews. It's here on the, on the screen here. Now, the book to the Hebrews, these were Hebrew Christians. They were Jewish Christians who evidently were in danger of reverting back to Judaism. And the whole book is, is written to encourage them not to do that. Why would you want to go back to that system when you have it all so much better in Christ? And here's what we read when we come to the very last chapter of that book. Coming up upon the last verse, not quite there yet. But I want you to note the exhortation that we find here. The writer says, let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. 
For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. To whom did God give that promise? To his people. Who are his people today? I hope we consider ourselves to be his people. And he goes on to say in the next verse, verse 6, So we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Be strong and of good courage is what this is saying. Now here's an interesting side note. As you look at this passage, do you notice that verse 6 is in italics? Now sometimes italics in the Bible means that the translators have added words that are not in the text to help the meaning. But also Old Testament quotations in the New King James, which we're reading from this morning, are put in italics so that we recognize that the writer is quoting an Old Testament passage. Now, if you have your Bible open, maybe you have one of those study Bibles, and some of them have a center column in there, and, and, you, and they have maybe a number or an asterisk or something like that, and they say, for this particular verse, see this one or this one. It's a cross-reference, right? If you have one of those Bibles, most likely you're going to find these two passages either in that center column or in the margin. And one of them is going to be, whoops, I put this in here, that's what happened, Joshua 1 and verse 5. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life as it, I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. The writer there of Hebrews 13 is quoting Joshua 1 and verse 5. And he's telling us that that passage applies to us. I dare anybody to deny that. Because if you do, you have an issue with the writer. There's another passage you might find in that center column. And it would be Deuteronomy 31, verses 6 and 7. From Moses. That's why, we want, that's why we're considering both Moses and Joshua and the people. And pay attention. Verse 6, Moses says, Be strong and be of good courage. Do not fear nor be afraid of them. For the Lord your God, he is the one who, give, who goes with you. He will not forsake you nor for, uh, leave you nor forsake you. Then Moses called Joshua and said to him in the sight of all Israel, Be strong and be of good courage. First of all, he said it to the people. And then he says the same thing to Joshua. For you must go with this people to the land which the Lord has sworn to their fathers to give them. And you shall cause them to inherit it. Now, I want you to notice what's going on in Joshua chapter 1. You got God encouraging Moses. Moses encouraging the people, God encouraging Joshua, Moses encouraging the people, and the people encouraging Joshua. Brethren, that's mutual edification. That's what makes us strong. That's what causes us to have good courage. And these people... On that occasion, felt the need to encourage their leader. What do we read back in Hebrews chapter 10 about not 
forsaking the assembly? What was the purpose of that? Was it not to encourage the church? You're not here either to, re, to encourage or to receive encouragement. You know, sometimes we use that passage to, uh, I say, beat people over the head with it. You've got to be at church. But we never talk to them about why they need to be here and what they ought to be doing. You know, even as we're singing our songs this morning, I was looking at the words and said, oh, what wonderful words we're singing. And I'm being encouraged by the words, and I'm singing them, and you're singing them, and we're being encouraged by one another. And yet we live in, in a society now that we expect to be entertained. Uh, well, what, what do I get out of it? Well, generally, you don't get any more out of it than what you put in it. And so they, they, people walk away, I didn't get anything out of that. Well, it didn't cost you anything either, did it? That is what we're supposed to be doing, my brethren. And when we do that, we will be strong and of good courage. Joshua now calls the people to faithfulness. We're coming to the end of our study this morning. I want us to go back and look at that first chapter again. Look at verse 10. God, Joshua has received his calling. He's told to be strong and be courageous. And notice what we read beginning with verse 10. Then Joshua commanded the officers of the people saying, Pass through the camp and command the people saying, Prepare provisions for yourself, for within three days you will cross over this Jordan to go to possess the land which the Lord your God is giving you to possess. Long at last, after 40 years, because of the change in the people's hearts, they're going to be able to take occupation to that promised land but they couldn't do it until their hearts were changed. It just would not happen. And in return, the people, as we said, encourage Joshua. Let's read Joshua 1, verses 16 through 18 once again. I just love this. And, and you say, well, we already did that. Just bear with me. Here's what we have. So they answered Joshua saying, all that you command us we will do and whatever you, wherever you send us we will go. You just told them you're going to go in and take that land. We're going. What happened 40 years before then? They refused to go in, didn't they? That's what resulted in the 40 years of wandering. But what do the people say now? Let's go. We're ready. Just as we heeded Moses in all things, so we will heed you. Only the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. Whoever rebels against your command and does not heed your words and all that you command him shall be put to death. Only be strong and of good courage. Who did they say that to? Their new leader. Joshua. Isn't this a powerful chapter? I'm thrilled to even read it. You see, not until then would God's people be successful, and neither will we be successful. God's promises that if we follow these principles, we will be successful. You know what the problem with that statement is? Having people define success. Many people in the church define success in worldly terms. That is not success. We are talking about true success. We're talking about victory that people in this world will never experience just by the very nature of life, we all die. 
And whatever you gain, you leave behind. That's not success. When I read this, I think of the example of Jesus and what he had to say in Matthew chapter 16. He says, For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? Or says, I gained the whole world. I'm successful. What does Jesus say? You are a loser because you lost your soul. Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Some people this morning are exchanging their souls for entertainment. For a day at the lake. For sporting events. They sold out and they are losers because they lose their own souls. You know, I mentioned in Bible class this morning that God has never called upon us to go anywhere where he hasn't gone or has sent his son to go before us. We were talking about the fact that uh, the people were not to go before the Ark of the Covenant into the, into the uh, Jordan River. And once they were in the Jordan River and the priests were, were with the Ark and had led them into the Jordan River and the river was dry, then all of Israel could pass by on the other side. But God went first. What shall a man give in exchange for his soul, the Lord asked. He had ever right to ask that question. Because on one occasion he was tempted by that very thing. In Matthew chapter 4, the third temptation that Satan brought before Jesus was this. And again the devil took him up on the exceeding high mountain. And showed him all the kings of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. In other words, he's offering them the whole world. You know what? After thinking about this, I think he could have given it to them too. He seems to be the ruler of this world, right? That's what, that's what our battle is about. Then Jesus said him, to him, to Satan, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. That was a statement of faithfulness. And he will not have any of this compromise with Satan. Are you compromising with Satan? Have you really thought about true success in your life? What are you learning from Jesus? What have you been learning from these wonderful stories that we read in the Old Testament of God's people? They made a lot of mistakes, didn't they? Surely we don't want to make the same mistakes, do we? They didn't inherit their promised land. I sure hope we will ours. But that's up to you and me. God says, I'll be with you. I'll never forsake you. I'll never leave you. But you have to make that decision to follow me. And when I mean follow me, follow me, you follow me exactly by what I say. You don't go to the left, you don't go to the right. I'm seeking to have communion with you. I want a relationship with you. But first of all, I can't do that if you have sin. 
because sin separates me from you because I'm a holy God. What are you doing about your sins? Or even a child of God, we offer the invitation. Our time is gone. Uh, once again, go back and look at those verses. They're listed here in your outline this morning. And just ponder on them. I did this week, and I was blessed. I challenge you to do the same thing. And do what you know your God wants you to do in obedience to him if he's your Lord and Master. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things I say, Jesus asked in John 6, 46. Which simply means we have no right to call him our Lord if we're not doing what he tells us to do. Whatever it is that you need to do to become a Christian through faith, repentance, confession, and baptism, or rededicate your life to Christ, if we can help, be helpful with that, even in prayer, we're here to encourage one another. We've made that clear this morning, haven't we? What will you do? Make it known as together we stand and stand. Sing.